Uh, middle school, can I just say that Wednesday night is truly the best night of the week, uh, and that's large part because of you guys. And while I enjoyed Christmas break, I actually missed you guys a lot. And so I'm super excited to have the opportunity once again uh, just to share and open God's word with you. Uh, and I love, I love all of you guys. And so thank you guys for just giving me the time just to, to share. And I will just say a couple quick things. Um, I really believe God has something to say to all of us tonight. I've really wrestled a lot um, with what we're going through. I've heard it said before that when you teach, the first person you should teach is to yourself. Uh, and so just know that I know that I'm not perfect uh, with what I'm going to be talking about tonight, but I, I'm by God's grace, I, I'm trying to do my part. And so I see some faces that were here last week, but I also see some faces here that weren't. So if you weren't here, uh, we started a new series called TGATS, which I like to call it, but how Zach, which we were calling it, uh, kind of not abbreviated, is, is the gospel according to Satan. And so, yes, in churches we talk a lot about the gospel, which, is the good, which means good news, which basically tells the story of why Christ came to earth. He came to earth to live the perfect life that you and I couldn't because of our sin, so that he could be the perfect sacrifice for our sin, so that we could enter into a right relationship with the most perfect and holy uh, God of the universe. But I want you guys to think about that word gospel. Satan, he likes to tell us lies that on the outside look like good news, but in reality, they're really further from, from anything that could be good. They're bad news for us if we believe them. In fact, Paul in Colossians 2.8 says that we as Christians need to make sure that we ha- aren't held captive by hollow and empty beliefs that actually ha- come from Satan and his minions themselves. And that's what this entire series is all about. We're going to be talking about things that you might hear in this world. They might even be said in Christian circles, but we need to take a closer look at them through God's word to understand whether or not what we're hearing is true. To kind of introduce tonight's topic, I want to tell you guys um, a couple quick stories, but wait, let me go back to one other thing. So as we head into this series, you guys, week number two, I kind of want to make a couple things clear that God's word says in regards to a battle that we're in. The first thing you guys need to realize according to God's word is that we're all in a spiritual uh, battle. Whether you believe in Jesus or not, Satan has one mission. John 10.10 10 says that the thief or Satan comes to kill, steal, or destroy. Ephesians 6.12 says that our battle isn't against flesh and blood, but against Satan and his evil minions. 1 Peter 5.8 says, be on the lookout because our enemy, Satan, is like a roaring lion looking for someone to spiritually devour. Satan's goal is, is to destroy you. He doesn't want you to have everlasting life in Jesus Christ. And he's made it his mission to do whatever it takes to bring you down with him. Another thing I want you guys to keep in mind is that Satan, the way that he brings us down is is that he begets us to believe lies. If you go back to Genesis 3, you have Eve talking to Satan and he can, Satan sees Eve looking at the, uh, the, a tree that God tells Adam and Eve that they can't touch and they can't eat from. And I'm sure he's watching Eve looking at that tree. And in fact, in Genesis 3, it says that the fruit of this tree looked pleasing to Eve. So he probably saw her looking at it. And, he pro- and, then I, and as we read in Genesis, he comes up to Eve and says, hey, you should eat that. And Eve says, no, I can't say that. I can't eat that because God said that if I eat it, I'll die. And listen to what Satan says to Eve in Genesis 3.3. He says, you won't die. (laughs) In other words, Satan is trying to get Eve, and he tries to get us to doubt what God says is true. And sometimes what he'll do is he'll throw a little bit of things that God will say, but he'll twist it. So we've got to be really careful about what we hear and about what we read online, and we need to always go back to God's word. But here's the good news. God is greater than Satan, and with the help of Jesus Christ and his truth, we can overcome him. God's word is one of our greatest defenses against Satan. And I just want to encourage you, tonight we're going to be going through a lot of different verses, and I'm not going to have time to go through them all, 
But I really would encourage you, when whoever's up here, always have your Bible in front of you. You need to test everything. Even, uh, I know I can make mistakes, but in one of the ways that you can uh, defeat Satan yourself is to make sure that you know God's word yourself. And don't just rely on other things or other people to tell you what it says. To introduce tonight's topic, I want to tell you guys a few things about me. Um, all of these things may or may not be true. Uh, when I was four years old, for whatever reason, uh, in the 90s, uh, my parents thought it was a good idea to put a uh, leash on me. Yes, it was like it was Velcro and it went around my wrist. I was one of those kids that went everywhere and I didn't listen to my parents. And one day uh, I was at Target with my mom and when she wasn't looking, I took off the Velcro, put it on a mannequin and I ran away. A few minutes later, I heard her scream, Tyler, Andrew, and the mannequin just fell onto the ground because, you know, I was a kid and I wanted to explore. Uh, also, uh, around that age, uh, I was at a grocery store and I had a paper clip. For whatever reason, my, mo- my mom thought it was a good idea for me to have a paper clip. And I made it flat and I put it into an outlet and I got electrocuted. Uh, when I was in junior high, uh, I had the great idea, because I heard from other people who did this, how fun it was to smash pumpkins. And uh, one of my friends was really nervous about it, and of course, I convinced him into doing it in his neighborhood. And I was like, guys, we're not going to get caught. Don't worry about it. Um, And sure enough, he got caught. Uh, We didn't, and the police showed up at his house, and uh, he had to pay the price for it. He didn't rat us out. Uh, In college, I did a lot of really smart things. Uh, um, One of them was with my buddy Greg. We found the largest serving bowl that we could find, and we just put cocoa puffs in it, and we put milk in it. And we naturally ate the whole thing. Uh, I remember throwing up several times that night because of how much uh, Cocoa Puffs I ate. And I haven't heard from Greg for a while, but the last I heard about Greg, he actually has this video on YouTube in which he uh, went to a white castle and he ordered everything on the menu and he ate it all in one sitting. So I don't think Greg really learned much from that. Uh, also in college, uh, we would... I would sit on top of cars while driving through my campus at Northwestern College. Uh, it got to the point where I actually had to sit down with the dean, and he was basically like, soda beer, if you do this one more time, you're out of here. That was the last time I did that. And then right after college, I had the opportunity to uh, do a DTS with YWAM in Kona, Hawaii. And every single Friday uh, afternoon when we had the day off, we would go to a certain cliff uh, in Kona, and we would jump off. Uh, I remember the first time I did it, uh, there was quite the undertow, and I nearly died. And so you might be asking, okay, Tyler, uh, why are you telling me the stories? Why would you do these things in the first place? And I'll give you one answer, and that's YOLO. You only live once. YOLO, right? I know that that saying is probably outdated. Some of you guys may know what it means. Uh, it actually came out uh, officially like in pop culture in like 2011, but this concept of seizing the day has been around here and around the world for a long time. Basically, YOLO is this concept that because we only have one life to live, we should do whatever we want, regardless of what happens, regardless of the consequences. And and, and really, kind of the heartbeat of YOLO is we got to make our lives count so that we don't have any regrets. And you know what? I, I would say my generation was told that a lot. But I think your generation, middle school students, is told that a lot as well, whether you realize or not. It's in our music, it's in our culture, it's things we read, it's things that we hear. Live life up, because we only got one life to live. And so tonight, we're going to be taking a look at this concept of YOLO. We're going to be taking a look about what we can accept from this concept. The world tells us to live it up, because we have one life. What we need to reject about uh, YOLO And then here's the big idea that I want you guys to think about. Here's the beautiful thing about Jesus, is that when we hear things that aren't true, we can go back to God's word, and not only can we see what we should reject about it, but how can Christ use what we're interacting with, and how can he redeem it? And actually, I believe that in order to live a life for Jesus Christ, as we look through scripture, we actually need to uh, embrace a redeemed view of YOLO. And so I'm super excited to kind of just uh, dive through that. Before we do, let's pray. 
Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for these middle school students. God, I thank you um, that you knew before the creation of time that each of them would be hanging out here uh, at Next for the best night of the week, but most importantly, to hear what your word has to say to them. So Lord, I just ask that my words would be yours. God, I pray that we, that we would each uh, take something away and that you would help us to have a redeemed understanding of YOLO. Powerful and precious name, amen. All right. So I'm going to give you guys three things to consider that a redeemed uh, view of uh, YOLO requires. The first thing that I want you guys uh, to remember is that we need to live like we're dying. This is what YOLO gets right. YOLO's belief is because we uh, have one physical life to live and we're going to die, we got to make something of our life. I'll talk a little bit later about what it means to make something of our lives, but YOLO gets that right. If you think about it, I don't think there's anybody here um, that hasn't known somebody who's, who's passed away. Ecclesiastes 9.2 says that no one, whether they're wicked or righteous, can escape physical death. And because of that, Psalm 90.12 says that we need to number our days. In other words, we need to be mindful of the days that we have here on earth. James 4.4 4 says that we, can't, we should make plans, but we can't always uh, just be so confident in our plans because nothing is certain in this life except for physical death because life is like a mist. Instead, our attitude should be if God wants us or if it's God's will to do these things, we should. So YOLO gets this right. We need to live our lives like we're dying because we are. Each second of every day, you guys, we're each closer to the day that we're going to physically die. The second thing, but this is what YOLO gets wrong, is we need to understand that as Christians, I'll explain it, we live twice, but we only die once. And non-believers, they only live once, but they're gonna die twice. John 3.3 3, and in John eleven twenty five 25 through 26, Jesus says that no one comes to the Father or God unless they are born again, because he, Jesus, is the source or road to eternal life. And this concept of being born again, when I was in middle school, it was super confusing to me. And I, I don't want to confuse you, but this illustration has been really helpful to me. I was talking to my daughter about this. So this concept of being born again, consider this for a moment. Consider a butterfly. They're born once physically as a caterpillar, but then they enter a cocoon, but then they, through a complete metamorphosis, they kind of have a second birth in some ways, and they emerge as a butterfly. The Bible says that we as Christians experience two births. Every person on this earth has a physical birth, but if you come to know Jesus, you actually have a spiritual birth in which your soul and your, and, and is transformed and hopefully through the Holy Spirit and you listening to him will be conformed to the likeness of Jesus. And the only death a Christian will ever experience is a physical one. Think about that. Because when we die, if we know Jesus, we'll one day have the opportunity to spiritually live forever. We're going to see Jesus face to face. And life, physical life as we know it, will transition into a spiritual one. But the Bible says that those who don't know Jesus will live one life, physical life on earth, but they'll experience two deaths, one physical one, but also one spiritual one. The good news of the gospel is that we as Christians and all people have the ability to be saved from our sins. The bad news, which is the truth, is that there's consequences for those of us who don't have Jesus as our perfect Lord and Savior. If you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus, if any of this is confusing, I just want to let you know that we're here to answer any of, and all of your questions. I'm here for you. Uh, the gospel didn't make a lot of sense to me when I was in middle school. It took me a while to wrestle. I had a lot of questions. And if you have questions, know that you are amongst people that love and care about you, and you can ask your questions. Uh, if you do know Jesus, I just want to put something in perspective for you. If you know Jesus, this world is the worst it's ever going to get. Yes, there's some great things about being alive, right? Taco Bell, next students. There's a lot of really bad things. Suffering, war, pain, 
I heard Tyler Sotomayor, thank you. <laughs> That's bad, thanks, I know. But just think about it. If you know Jesus, this world is, is the worst you're gonna ever experience. But if you don't know Jesus, somebody who doesn't know Jesus, this is the best they're ever gonna experience because two deaths await them. All right, I'm gonna spend the most of my time in this third point. And to illustrate this, I have this rope. And so I want you guys to pretend that this rope represents your entire existence, entire. Birth, and then what comes after life, eternity. Okay, so the red on this rope represents actually how much time in all of our existence, let's pretend this rope keeps going around this room, because that's what it'd be unending for eternity. This red represents actually how much time we spend on earth. The rest of this, which is going to keep going around this room, represents eternity, the, the, the time that we're going to spend with God after we die. You guys, if you think about a worldly view of YOLO, it only focuses on the red. YOLO, a worldly view of YOLO says you need to have as much fun as you want. You need to make as much money as you want. You should make as many dumb decisions as you want because this is all that there is. But the good news of the gospel, a, a redeemed view of YOLO says, hey, because you only have this much life to live, it's not that much in, in light of eternity, you have to make it count for something. I've said this verse before, but Ecclesiastes 11.9 is one of my favorite verses. And I'll be honest with you, I was living uh, for the red a lot, a lot in my middle school and most of my high school until I came to know Jesus. And then I had a, a, a youth leader challenge me to read uh, the book of Ecclesiastes, which was written by the wisest person to ever live. He opens up Ecclesiastes in the beginning. Solomon says, everything is meaningless. He kind of does this science experiment. He basically uh, lives out an ancient version of YOLO. I think that, that Solomon was kind of at a place in his life where he was kind of like, why am I here, God? Even though he had all this wisdom, he was still struggling to find his purpose. So he, he said that you know, having a lot of stuff was meaningless. He said having the best education was meaningless. You know, having a bunch of relationships is meaningless. He goes on and on and on. And then he says at the end of the, this book, he says a couple things I want to highlight. But Ecclesiastes 11.9, this is his advice to young people. It says, young people, it's a wonderful be thing to be young. Enjoy every minute. Do everything you want to do. Take it all in. But remember that you must give an account to God for everything you do. In other words, yes, God wants us to enjoy our time here in the red when we're physically here on earth. But realize that how we live in the red has implications for the rest of eternity. And if you know Jesus, you're one day gonna stand uh, before him and you're not gonna be judged for your sin, but based, I believe, uh, we read about something called the Bema Seat, and I'm not gonna get into it, but basically every believer is gonna stand before Jesus at the Bema Seat and we're gonna have to give an account for how we've lived our life here on earth, whether we've wasted our, our life in the red, or if we've lived for him during our short time here on earth. And some of us are going to receive rewards. And I don't know what those rewards are, but I'm pretty sure if they're coming from God, they're going to be awesome. And I think some of us aren't going to receive rewards. In fact, some of us, and, and I don't know where I land with this, I'm still reading with uh, different things I'm wrestling, but some of us might even have particular rewards that God desired to give us being taken away. So think about that. How we live our lives here on earth, if you're a Christian, matters. Unfortunately, if you do not know Jesus, as I said earlier, you are going to have the stand before God after you live your short time here on earth. And unfortunately, he's going to have to say to you, I'm so sorry, I can't let you into the kingdom of heaven because you don't know Jesus Christ. And so my challenge to you guys is, God can actually redeem this concept of YOLO. And this is what I've been wrestling with. Think about this for a second. Because YOLO, because I only have a short time here in the red here on earth, I need to live in such a way that matters for eternity. Because YOLO, you and I need to spend, should spend more time in the word. Because YOLO, you and I need to spend more time in prayer. 
Because YOLO, you and I need to stop thinking so much about ourselves and start thinking about other people, especially those that don't know Jesus. You can fill in the blank. Because you have only one life to live here on earth, we each need to live a life for Jesus here. Because what we do echoes in eternity. So that's what I have for you guys today. Uh, I'm going to pray for us, and we're going to break up into groups. But just know that, you guys, like, it's so easy to, to live our lives for things that don't really matter. Um, but thankfully, God is, has shown us in his word. I think he uses this thing called the church to remind us and show us uh, what we should be living for. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for these middle school students, even though they're in 6th, 7th, and 8th grade. Your word says in Timothy that um, no one should look down upon them because they are young, but rather these middle school students can show the rest of the church, adults that are older than them, what it means to live a life that matters. So God, I pray that in this moment and through this small group time, we would each uh, be encouraged and reminded about your word, about what we should be living for. We love you, Jesus. Amen.